Lama Dalit Amad Alif. And uh, we learned a few halachas about people who make a mistake, a chazan makes a mistake, skips. We learned about um, if the chazan is allowed to answer to the berchas kayanim, the blessing that the kayanim give to the, to the, to the congregation. Is the Chazan allowed to answer to that? Is he allowed to call Kayanim when he wants them to begin? And we've spoken about all these, uh, you know, details of if it's considered a hefsit, an interruption for the Chazan to recite some of these uh, statements like Amen or Kayanim, Yivarecha Hashem is he allowed to uh, recite the Yivarecha to uh, to help the Koyhain say it, and we uh, we might, went through the the uh, the different uh, opinions about calling out Koyhanim, and we said that there is a view that if you say the Alakeno Alakevaseno prayer, if you say that entire prayer. <laughs> you would be allowed to say out loud Kayanim, to call the Kayanim to start saying their blessing and recite and reciting the uh, the Yivarechacha. So there is, um, if you say that entire prayer, then for sure there's room to 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 say Kayanim out loud. Otherwise, Rabbeinu Tam wanted to say that it's a problem to say Kayanim. If you're not going to say a whole prayer, it's a problem. Uh, and that was the view of Rabbeinu Tam. There are obviously others that argue on it. We mentioned there the Sephardic minog is to just say Kayanim. And uh, I did mention about Rami Rutenberg, who also seems to say that. And uh, initially it says my Rami Rutenberg said, it's fine, say the whole prayer. And, uh, and then it says, it says that he changed his mind afterwards. And uh, it seems like we follow his initial view instead of the, what he changed his mind. But the Sephardim, it seems like they follow the fact that the Maharam Rutenberg changed his, changed his view. And he said that when you have Kayanim, you don't do, you don't do that prayer. You don't say that whole prayer. That prayer is really established only if there aren't any Kayanim. In any event, uh, we're going to now, uh, um, well, before, I was going to start the new Gemara, but there is one more piece I have to mention, and that is that uh, we spoke yesterday about when a person is asked to daven and lead the service, he's supposed to refuse. It's called Masariv. He's supposed to refuse. And uh, the Gemara compares refusal to salt. That just like it's good to have a little salt, you're supposed to refuse a little bit. Like food should have some salt. If you refuse, if you refuse too much, it's like having way too much salt, and you ruin the whole uh, dish. And therefore, uh, the Gemara says, similar to that would be when a person asks you to lead the service, you should refuse. And the reason behind it is that it shouldn't look like you are excited and proud that you are capable of leading the service. Instead, you should feel humble, maybe that you are not fit to, 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 to lead the service. And one of the commentaries mentions that the reason we compare it to salt is because the main dish is not the salt. The main dish is the other, is the main food. Salt gives it a little flavor, adds some flavor to it. But the main food is the, is the main dish. The same thing is the prayers. Of course, the main thing is the prayers. But how you walk up to lead the service, that adds some flavor to your service because you go up with like a mensch. You go up looking like you're not arrogant. And by doing it that way, 
you add flavor to your prayer. Imagine if someone uh, gives a whole scream and rant, and then he becomes the chazan. And then he, le- he go, walks up to the, it just doesn't fit well. It, it doesn't fit. It's not befitting of being a chazan. You, you know, you do your whole spiel and then, you, you know, and then you go. But if you act like a mensch and then you go up to be the chazan, then it's, it's uh, appropriate. Then, you know, you fit. It's, you added salt to your davening. Now it's like a re- people are happy to daven in this minion. It's a very menschlicha minion. It's a, it's a people of, uh, you know, refined. People are refined in this minion. Rabbi, uh, yes, Moshe. What about uh, somebody who's being called up for an al- aliyah? You know, I mean, uh, are they supposed to do the same thing? I mean, uh, no. Once you're called up for the aliyah, you know, this is a uh, you, you've you've been called up to to read. You have to go and, and and read in the Torah. But here we're talking about leading the service. Leading the service carries with it certain responsibility. In the olden days, it actually was reserved for only the most pious of the congregation. And you had to have fit certain criteria. Nowadays, we don't have that option. So people are the leaders, even if they don't fit. But even so, we have to try, we have to re, you know, feel like, realize that we are we aren't fit for it and we shouldn't be proud of going up to the to lead the service we you know we we walk up with humility yes uh, ben uh, on, on yom kippur we have a chazan coming in and every time he he's going up to the table he, he stops about 20 feet before it i guess it's the same part that you always get in and he starts with Hamelech. No. Uh-huh. Is that okay? Is that the way to do it? What did you want to say, Isaac? I just said Rosh Hashanah is different because he's standing on the side and that's the whole procedure. But you don't go right up to the Ahmed and then you walk up from there with everybody else. Yeah, I'm not sure the reason why why on Rosh Hashanah we, it's customary to do that. I don't know, um, but it is a common custom, not not in Lubavitch, but in other uh, communities, that the uh, the chazan starts in his where he's sitting or where, or as you say, yeah. twenty feet away, and he starts uh, the the stand the um, uh, certain uh, chanting, calling uh, Hamelach. Yeah, yeah, the the the, the tune. And then, yeah, and, and and then he goes up to the to the Yaman. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not Rebbe, sure there, this... there are a lot of things. My father always used to say about by Hashanis that when they were going around the Shulchan with Hashanis, there was one Rebbe who always, when it came to Paido Matzil Hashiana, he would always bend down very low and then stand up and keep going, and you know, do this in the because uh, some new guy came in and saw this and asked, why are you doing this? Nobody in the shul knew why they were doing it. It's one old guy sitting in the corner. He goes, in the old base medrash in Europe, the roof went down, so the beam was there. So when you got to that spot, you had to bend down to keep walking straight. And that became, you know, the minig for all chassid and forever. <laughs> right, right. No, there is a minug. There's definitely a minug to, uh, you know, to start. I, I, I guess we could look it up. Uh, the first place to look would be Rabbi Google. You could ask him. He's a very scholarly man. And Used to be Tamei Hamenhagen, but... Right. That's true. That's true. Tamei Hamenhagen. All right. Well, uh, okay. uh, we, we, could, we could definitely uh, check it out after. But... Um, uh, and, and it is definitely a minute. It's a minute in many, many shoals that they, that they uh, probably the whole Ashkenaz. Uh, uh, I don't know. In Sephardic shoals, do they do that as well, uh, Ezra? Uh, what, Rabbi? Do they, uh, does the Chazan on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, does he start singing 
the Hamelech chant from his seat, and then he walks up to the uh, to, to mm-hmm. the stender uh, afterwards, or or he just starts at everything at the stender wherever he's. Okay, first of all, we we don't do things the same way that you do. All right, so the the Chazan, if he starts at anywhere, he starts at Nishmat Kol Chai. Uh huh. Okay, uh, it, because uh, even there, Nishmat Kol Chai starts, uh-huh. and there is no difference. I mean, the tune is the same right. as if it were a regular Shabbat. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are no differences other than the the Abinda itself. So right. gotcha. beyond that, you would treat it like it's a regular Shabbat. Right, right. The scenario doesn't play itself uh uh it, to to be able to start somewhere else because you start at nishmas interesting okay well uh in ashkenazi communities as far as i know ben uh, they 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 do they do do that the one the ones that i'm aware of okay so in any event um the uh, the gemara mentioned that a person should normally under normal circumstances refuse to daven for the amud the first time then the second time he should like get ready to uh, to uh, to go and the third time they ask him can you please lead the service then he uh, uh, stretches his legs out and, and goes to the uh, to the to the uh, uh, teva to the to to, to, to to lead the service so uh, this is the uh, the common um, halacha actually is brought in halacha and uh, the only difference, the only thing that it says in halacha is that there is also a statement that says, Ein mesarvin l'gadol. So here we talk about mesari, that you have to be mesari, you're supposed to refuse. But it also says, Ein mesarvin l'gadol. You're not supposed to refuse a important person. So the rule is that if like the rabbi of the shul asks you to daven, you really should go right away because ain't misarvin the goal. We don't refuse for a very important, for an important person. But if uh, the Gabbai asks you or someone else in the, you know, the, the members of the community uh, congregation, they ask you, could you go up? Then you do the, this rule of Masarev the first time around you Masarev, the second time you're Mahar, Mahavev, you flicker. And the third time you actually go. So that's the uh, bro- that's what's brought in Shulchan Aruch, and um, the Gemara then brought a brisa that said that th- there are three things that too much of it is not good, but a little is good, and that's yeast, salt, and refusal, which it means that you're not supposed to refuse more than usual. Now we spoke yesterday what was bad about refusing too much. So one reason was that. It, it, refusing too much to go to, to, to lead the service makes it look like they're asking you to go up, but it's like below your dignity to listen to them. So you're refusing, you, you're, you're, you're so arrogant that you're not going to listen. You wait till they beg you. And because, you know, you, you're, you're, you're implying like you're arrogant. So that's another re- that's a reason, an explanation of why you're not supposed to refuse too much because of arrogance. And um, another reason that's brought is that you're implying like Hashem will not listen to your prayer, that you don't believe that God listens to your prayer, even though you're implying that you're humble, but you're also implying that well, God is not going to listen to my prayer, so I can't go up. And really, Hashem listens to every prayer. And the humility is good, that you shouldn't, you should refuse initially. But if you refuse afterwards as well, it implies like you don't believe that Hashem is Shemea to Philas Kolpe. Hashem listens to the prayers of every person, even those that aren't fit to pray. Hashem listens to their prayer. And you're implying like you, you don't believe that. And therefore, it's not right to refuse too much. So therefore, our Gemara tells us that that uh, the um, 
the person should refuse once, and the, you know, the second time, uh, like a semi, and the third time he's supposed to go up. Now, the Gemara then, the Gemara now, this new, new piece of Gemara, is going to talk about the Mishnah's statement, person made a mistake. And what we have to realize is, we're talking about a case where the person skipped, person skipped a paragraph in the middle of Shemona Esra. And he started saying the next paragraph. Maybe he even finished the next paragraph. And he caught, he realized he made a mistake. And uh, for whatever reason, he's not able to uh, continue Davin. He's embarrassed, he's nervous, he, he's beyond himself. So we're going to put someone else in his place. And the question is, where does that second person start? So we're going to see in the Gemara, there's really two opinions. So we are uh, on Lamed Dalet, 34a, Lamed Dalet, Lamed Aleph, 34a. And we're at the word Amar Rav Huna, which is maybe um, 20, uh, 22 lines from the top of the page. Amar Rav Huna, Rav Huna says, Ta'a b'shalash rishaymas. Person made a mistake in the first three blessings. So we, 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 we've learned before that there is a understanding that the first three blessings are like an entity in their own right. Because they're all about, first three brachas are all about praising Hashem. The last three brachas are also like a, an entity in their own right. They're all about thanking Hashem. The middle brachas are also like an entity of all the, the begging of Hashem, asking Hashem for one's needs. So Rav Huna takes this to an extreme. And he says, Ta person makes a mistake in the beginning, brachas. The new guy comes up, and he's going to take over. Where does he take over? So, Rav Huna says that if he made a mistake in the first three brachas, he goes to the beginning of the first three brachas. Be'em Tzoyis makes a mistake in the middle brachas. So, Chayzer Liata goes back, the, the new person who comes up goes back to the Ata And what happens if he makes a mistake in the last brachas? He goes back to the blessing that begins the avoida, which is Ritzei Hashem Alekena Ba'amcha Yisrael Filosom She'ei Bahashev Ha'avoida. He goes back to the bracha of avoida, uh, and that's the last three. So according to Rav Huna, the first three brachas are an entity of their own. And when one makes a mistake in one of them, and he needs to start from somewhere, the new person is going to come. He's got to go back to the beginning of those brachas, of that group. So the first group is the, you go back to the first. The last group, you go back to the first of the last three brachas. The middle group of 13 brachas in the middle, you got to go to the first one called Atochainen. That's the first one of the middle group. So Rav Huna holds, they're all bundled in groups, these brachas. And person makes a mistake. And one of them, you got to go to the beginning of that group. Now, Ravasi Yomar, Ravasi says, Em tzoyos ein lohen seidu. Ravasi says that the middle ones do not have an order.
Now, I'm translating this. I translated this Gemara. I have to, I have to preface what I'm saying. I translated this Gemara to, to be similar to the Mishnah. The Mishnah talks about a person made a mistake and, um, and uh, someone else is taking him over. So I translated this Gemara as well that, um, that, that, that it would mean the same thing if it's talking about two people. But it, actually, if you read the Gemara itself, it could be read as we're talking about one guy, he made a mistake, and we, you know, he 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 made a mistake, and uh, he started saying something else. Now, where does he go back to? We don't know where to where he should go back to. So here, this Gemara tells us where to go back to. So the Gemara tells us that according to Rav Huna, you got to go back to the beginning of that group. So you have the the first three praises of Hashem. You go back to the beginning. The middle uh, blessings are all about asking Hashem for things. Go to the first one of those, that whole, uh, uh, you know, the begging Hashem, asking Hashem for things. And then the third group is the thanks. That's Rav Huna's opinion. Rav Asi says, no, the middle ones don't have a Seder. Now, what does he mean by that? So Rashi tells us that if a person skipped a bracha, and then he, then what happened? He skipped a bracha, and then he remembered, Oi, I skipped the Yerushalayim Ircha. I skipped the bracha about Jerusalem. I went to the next one already. What should I do now? So according to Rav Huna, you had to go back to the beginning of the, According to Rav Huna, you would you would have needed to go to the beginning <coughs> of the um, um, of the uh, Atochinin. You would go to Atochinin, which is the beginning of the middle blessings of the Shimon Esri. According to Ravasi, this final view, the second view, Ravasi says that. You don't have to do everything in order. You make up what you missed and jump back to where you are. So again, there's 13 middle blessings of the Shemona Esrei. Let's say you skip the blessing number seven. And now you're at blessing number 10. What should you do? Ravasi says, do, do seven and then go to 10. And you don't have to do eight and nine again. You skipped seven. You did eight. You did nine. And now you're up to ten. And you say, oh, yeah, I forgot number seven. According to Ravasi, no problem. Do number seven. And then do number ten and eleven and twelve and continue finish. Now, Ravuna didn't say that. Ravuna said, oh, you skipped number seven? What do you got to do? Go back to number one. There were 13 middle blessings of the Shemona Esrei. Go to Atochoinen. You skipped one? Go to, go to number one. Go back to Atochoinen. <laughs> Ravasi? The, now I'm translating the Gemara according to Rashi's interpretation of this Gemara. And the way Rashi understands it, there's no order to the brachas. And you can say the one you missed wherever you are. And then jump right back to... Where, where, where you're up to. So you, you skip number seven and you're up to 10, do number seven and then do number 10. And you're all set. That is the two opinions of the Gemara. Now, before we do the next uh, line of the Gemara, I want to jump back to the Mishnah. So if everyone could look back at the Mishnah and uh, the Mishnah is on the top of the page. Uh, let's read the uh, second line of the Mishnah, it's line four in the Gemara. Uh, the Mishnah starts on the third line. So line four of the Gemara uh, is Ha'over Lefnei HaTeva, a person who uh, goes and leads the congregation, he stands before the ark. Vita'a, and he made a mistake. Yavor Acher Tachto, you put someone else in his place. 
So the first guy made a mistake and he's lost. He can't uh, be, compose himself. So we're, we're going to let, so we're going to have someone else take over. And at that time, when you need someone to take over, because you're in the middle of the Shemona Esrei, the Chazan, the leader is in the middle of the, the repetition. So you, you shouldn't be a Sarvan, a refusenik, someone who refuses to take, don't refuse at that time, because this is not the appropriate time to refuse, as we mentioned in the Gemara. Normally, a person should say, no, I'm not fit to lead the congregation. But here we need a substitute because the other person is in the middle of leading the of leading the service and he got stuck somewhere. So now we need you. So don't be a sarvan. Don't be a refusal. Now, and this is the most important thing that I'm bringing is this line. Where does he start from when he takes over? So you found a substitute. The first guy messed up. Now you have a substitute. Where is the substitute going to take over from? So the, the Mishnah says, Mitchilas habracha shata'azeh. He starts from the beginning of the blessing that this one messed up. Now, who does that sound like? Rav Huna or Rav Asi? Rav, Asi. Rav Huna said, you got to start all the way from the beginning of the group. So in the middle, again, there's three in the beginning three in the end, and 13 in the middle. Rav Huna says, you messed up in number seven. Go back to the, 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 the beginning of this group, number one of this group. You got to start from the beginning. What does the Mishnah say? The Mishnah said, you start from the beginning of the blessing you messed up. Sounds like you start from seven, not from number one. So it doesn't seem to fit with Rav Huna. With Ravasi, maybe it fits because Ravasi says, go back, go to, go to number seven, do number seven. That's where you messed up, you skipped it, do number seven. But Rav Huna doesn't seem to, to fit with this because Rav Huna says, you got to go back to number one. So the Gemara asked this question on Rav Huna from our mission. Now, I have to, I have to really explain who, what we're dealing with here. The Mishnah is written by a Tana. The author of the Mishnah is a, the Tanoim. And the later rabbis who authored the Gemara, the Talmud, they are not allowed to argue on a Mishnah. So the way we understand Rav Huna and Rav Asi have to fit with the Mishnah. They can't be contradicting the Mishnah. So it must fit with the Mishnah. The Mishnah said that you start the bracha that you messed up on. In the Gemara, Rav Huna said, you start from the beginning of that group. So let's read inside the Gemara. Let's go back to the Gemara. Mesiv Rav Sheshas. Rav Sheshas asks a very strong question. He asks a contradiction on Rav Huna. Mehechanu where does he go back to? He says, it says in the Mishnah, where does he go back to? The Mishnah said, you go back to the beginning of the bracha that this person made a mistake on. How does that fit with Rav Huna, who says, you go back to the beginning? Tiyuvta de Rav Huna, the Gemara Tiyuvta means like busted. Rav Huna, we just proved you wrong. That's what Tiyufta means. Tiyufta, we have now proven Rav Huna wrong. Tiyufta de Rav Huna. But the Gemara says, no, hold on. Not a, it's the, you haven't proven, proven him wrong. Amar lach Rav Huna. Rav Huna could answer you. Rav Huna could answer back. Em tsoyos kulhu choda birchas aninhu. Rav Huna looks at all the middle blessings, not only as one group, they're like one bracha. He looks the, at, at the middle blessings of the Shemona Esrei, of the uh, Amidah. Those middle blessings are considered like one blessing because they're all about requesting one's needs. That's what the middle blessings are. So the Mishnah says you got to go back to the bracha that you messed up in 
The literal meaning of that is number se- blessing number seven. You skip blessing number seven. Go back to blessing number seven. But Rav Huna's translation of it, it's not that Rav Huna said something wrong that doesn't fit. You could fit it with the Mishnah, but you have to translate it a little differently. The Mishnah says you go to the beginning of the bracha that you messed up in. That bracha that you messed up in is a combination of all those 13 brachas. That's what he means. Go to the beginning of those 13 because it's all one bracha. He looks at all 13 as if it's one. So it says you got to go to the beginning of that bracha that you messed up in. It means blessing number one out of the 13 because he looks at all of them as one bracha. We don't go to number seven because number seven, is it's, it, it, you're, it, it implies like it's a bracha of its own. It's not. It's all one blessing. So Rav Huna is saying you got to go to the beginning of that group because it's all like one blessing. And that's what the Mishnah means. So Rav Shesha thought that he proved Rav Huna wrong, but really Rav Huna has an, a reply. He explains that he doesn't, he doesn't mean, the Mishnah doesn't mean what you think it means. It means like what I'm saying, Rav Huna says. So that's the, this is the uh, Gemara. This is the uh, conclusion of the Gemara. Taisvis has a different interpretation. And Taisvis over here says, that it's very hard to imagine that Ravasi holds that you can, if a person skipped blessing number seven and he's up to blessing number 10, very hard to imagine you're going to do number seven and then jump to number 10. That would be doing things not in order. And we have sources, Taisvis tells us, and he show, tells them that there are sources that the blessings of the Shemona Esrei have to be in order, just like the Megillah. If you read the Megillah, you have to read the Megillah in order. You can't read a paragraph or uh, chapter five and then read chapter three of the Megillah on Purim. Purim, we read the Megillah. You can't jump around. You can't go backwards. <laughs> The, the same thing would apply to Halel. Same thing applies to Shema. You can't read a few verses here and then go back and read a few verses that you skipped. So why would you... Tri- uh, he, so Taisus asked a question on Rashi. How could Rashi learn that you could make up blessing number seven and then jump to the blessing number 10? It can't be. <coughs> now, I will tell you that the wording of Ravasi does imply like Rashi's interpretation. It's just that it doesn't fit with other Gemaras. It doesn't fit. It doesn't, you, you know, you, you can't say that that's the meaning. It does sound like Rashi's explanation, but, it, but you, can't, you can't translate it that way. So therefore, Taisvis learns that the meaning of Ravasi is that if you skipped blessing number seven and you're up to blessing number 10, you are allowed to go back to blessing number seven and then do blessing number eight and number nine a second time and then do number 10. Because now at least you're doing things in order. You did mess up. You said blessing number eight, nine, and it, it, before you did number seven, you did mess up initially. So you messed the order up a little. But now, if you go back to number seven, we will consider it as if you said the blessings in order because you did say one, two, three, four, five, six in order. You did mess up and said eight and nine. But now you're going to go back to seven. And so ultimately, they're all being said in order because you're going to say eight and nine again and then do number 10. So Taisvis and Rashi are, there's an argument between Rashi and Taisvis in the view of Ravasi. What does he mean? Yes, uh, Ezra. No, I had a question. So if, if Rav Huna believes that, every, that the middle prayers are considered to be one, then how do we allow, for example, to insert things like Nachem in the middle of of uh, of the you know of the 
uh, uh, prayer for uh, for the binyan of Yerushalayim, or even to say uh, the other things that uh, we're being allowed to say in um, in Shema Kolenu, because if they're considered to be one thing, then those things should be said after the fact and before the last three brachot. So what you're saying is if you want to add anything, you feel it shouldn't be added, no, no, inserted. No, no. And not if, if you want to. I'm saying the rabbis. The rabbis should not insert anything inside the middle of these 13 blessings because they're really one blessing. And if, they, if the rabbis are going to insert something, it should be inserted at the end. Of the, th of the 13 blessings. Right. If, if we follow Rav Huna, it says, you know, a bracha, you know, you know, hadhu. So it's it's one it's one bracha. So how can you then insert other things? Because then uh, you are dis you're disturbing the order that 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 uh, that these thirteen brachas were were set and defined. Right. In fact, in it's fact, the other, the other question you can ask is, how can Shmuel Akata and come up with this other one and stick it in the middle of these thirteen brachot? It should have been added at the very end of of the other of the twelve. Right. Is it Makolenu, so which is the last one? No, no, I'm not talking about that. All I'm saying is, if you're, if Rav Huna is correct, then all these other things that he's defined. Anything that you add should be added at the very end of 13 before the last three brachot. It is. And no, 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 no. What Nachem, is Nachem is put into the one about Yerushalayim. And anything, and, and the one about the, uh, wow. uh, you know, and, 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 uh, Aneinu. Aneinu is put into the Shema Koleinu. All no, no, those no. Are, are insertion. The Chazan says it in uh, before Rafaino. So you have a good question. Ezra is asking some good, good, good questions, and I would, I would even say anything that's added in in Shmakaleno is still a question. How could you insert it in Shmakaleno not after? You know, so, Shmakaleno so is part of the thirteen one blessing. So it's, part, it's still part of that one blessing. So, so you have a, you have a good question, Ezra. So isn't that isn't that a isn't that a Tiufta, if you want to call it that, to so, Rav Huna. Right. So, so, so the thing is that if we step back and we think about um, the additions of, um, uh, let's say, on, on, on between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you add certain additions to the Shemona Esri. Those additions that you add, they're in the first three brachas, they're in the last three brachas. You add additions there. How can you add those additions? We know that the first three brachas are like one entity according to everyone. And the last three brachas are one entity according to everyone. How could you add those? That, that would be a question according to everyone. So it must be that even though we, we consider these three as one entity, one blessing, but it's not, doesn't mean that the rabbis don't have the right to, especially, you know, the rabbis that, that authored the, the, you know, or, or in the time of the Talmud when they decided to add that extra blessing or they, they added the, the requests of between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, those rabbis that were in the league of, uh, you know, of, of, of deciding what should be added into the Shemona Esrei, they had the, uh, the right to add that, to add a blessing or to add statements in the first three blessings, the last three. And the same thing would apply to the middle blessings. So that's why um, uh, it, it wouldn't really prove Rav Huna wrong just because they added them, because the, the fact is they added, those, uh, they added st stuff even to the first three and to the last three. Obviously, they had the right to add and include stuff in that blessing. In other words, they are the ones who had the right to author you know, to, to authorize this. So, but you're right. We would not be able to add, according to Rav Huna, it would be more strict. It would seem that maybe for us to, to want to do something, you know, um, 
uh, and the question would be, would we be allowed, according to Rav Huna, are you really allowed to add, like we add stuff in Shema Kaleinu, and we're, we're allowed to, it says, we're allowed, would Rav Huna agree with that? Would Rav Huna agree that we could add our own requests in Shema Kaleinu? But even there, I think, you know, the understanding is that the rabbis that established and authorized the wording of the Shemona Esrei, they authorized us to, an area where to include blessings and requests. And they also authorized us in the middle of each of blessing, if we have a specific request for the blessing of Rifa Enu, we could even add it there as well. So the rabbis who authorized and, and they, they, they authored, I should say, they authored the Shemona Esrei, they included this option of, uh, of uh, you know, inserting stuff as well, but it, uh, definitely an interesting point, Ezra. That you know that it would seem that Rav Huna has more of a would be more strict, maybe about those thirteen. I just don't know an example of where, you know, where we could where we could um, uh, see a major difference between Rav Huna and Rav Asi. Besides, for the case that the Gemara says where you skip the bracha, you know, do you do you do you have to say all thirteen in order? Um, but um, but but yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought of, of would would there be any stringency according to Rav Huna in in the fact that these thirteen brachas are like one? That that's a good good a good point if we could only figure out a scenario where it would express itself. Yes, uh, sure. Susan. Oh, I'm sorry, as Ezra, I didn't realize you wanted to say it. Ezra. Yeah, yes. no. So so basically, what what this so what do we do if we accidentally skip? We go back to where we skipped, Ooh, and then from that point, question. repeat everything. So, the, the Tysus over here tries to figure out who do we pasca like, who do we follow, and he says two things. He says number one, who normally quotes? Who's the teacher? Rav Huna or Ravasi? Rav Huna often quotes Ravasi. I'm a Rav Huna, I'm a Ravasi. So Rav Huna often quotes Ravasi, Teisra says. And uh, because of that, it sounds like Ravasi is the, is the teacher. Now, if Ravasi is the teacher, it would seem that we should follow the teacher more than the student. Additionally, Taisva says that Rav Sheshes tries to prove Rav Huna wrong, which means that Rav Sheshes disagrees with Rav Huna. So Rav Sheshes also agrees with Rav Asi. So here we've got two reasons to follow Rav Asi. So Taisva wants to paskin like Rav Asi, which would mean that you wouldn't have to start from the beginning of the Atachoinen, like Rav Huna says, Instead, you would go back to where you skipped and say those brachas in order. Now, you're, but what you're asking me is, what about Rashi's view? Maybe we should follow Rashi, who says that you can um, uh, just say blessing number seven and, and jump to number 10. Now, that would be a question. Could you do that? I don't think so. I don't think we hold that way. We hold that the brachas need to be in order. And, uh, and in every bracha, it's important to have it in the right order. And you wouldn't be able to make up a bracha number seven and then jump to blessing, uh, blessing number, number 10. So I, I doubt that in Shulchan Aruch that it would follow Rashi here. I believe we follow Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu Tam's, uh, the Toysus here. And um, uh, I, Rabbi, I, I, yeah. think, I think Rashi is trying to make sure that you're not saying and that's the reason why he's saying correct go back do seven then go back to where you were before and continue and so the question on the individual on on, on um Rav Asi or even Rav Huna so what do you do with the ones that you've already said I mean how are they you know because you're repeating them again right so what happens to the first set so, so this is a good question. Um, Ezra's asking, you know, it, it ends up being a brachal of Atala. 
when you have to repeat blessing number eight and nine. Again, you skip blessing number seven. You jumped to blessing. You, 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 you did. You're, you're up to. Ble- you, 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 I'm sorry. You didn't. You skipped blessing number seven. Right. You skipped blessing number seven. You said eight and nine. And now Tysus is telling us do seven and then repeat eight and nine. What do you mean? Brachal of Atala, I already said blessing eight and nine. How can I say God's name in, in vain, so to speak? And, uh, and you just do it again. And so that's Ezra's question. It's a very good question. And the answer is that what the, Rashi and Tysus are obviously arguing about a very, um, um, a very uh, important point here is, is a Shmona Esrei that you don't do in order, is that considered a valid Shmona Esrei? Because if it's not valid, then you ruined the entire Shmona Esrei. So, so Rashi thinks he's got a, you know, a solution, do seven and then do 10. Taisa says, your solution and, and you're, 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 you're causing that eight and nine is not invalid. My view, you invalidated everything. So Tysus looks at Rashi and says, you, you know, you think you're not invalidating your blessings? Eight and now you're not going to have a problem with eight and nine? Guess what you just did? You just ruined blessing number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, until nine, you bl- ruined 19 blessings because Shemona Esrei needs to be in order. So they're, they're really arguing about this major important point of the Shemona Esrei blessings being in order. And if they're not in order, you did not fulfill your obligation. You got to go over and start all over from number one and do them now all in order. So again, Rashi, uh, it seems like he's going to hold that, that it's not a problem to, to, to mess up the order in this scenario. Uh, it, 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 it's very, it's hard to understand how Rashi could hold this way. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Tysus brings sources and proofs that, that, that there, there are clear sources that you can't, you can't do it in a way called delug skipping and uh, Siroigen and bad, not in order. And um, and he also brings the, the Rashbam and the Rif, both also agree that uh, that with, with Taisvis. So it's not like, you know, so it's, it's, so Rashi's view we, we need to look into, but uh, the, the, the question that you're asking, that it's a brachal of Atala, it, it's not really a, a, a question according to Taisvis, because Taisvis says, you're right. It's a brachal of atala, but it's a but but you, otherwise you, you didn't daven. So you you already made those brachal of atalas already. It's too late. At least do at least do a shemana esrei now. Those were brachal of atalas from the beginning. You already made brachal of atalas. You can't fix that. At least daven now, and you could fix. It. You could you could at least do a good shemana esrei. Yes, Ezra. So why can't I say the same thing that Rashi says about the Torah? There's no, there's no before and there's no after. If that is the case, then I can explain Rashi's point of view that, you know, the same thing is true with the, with the Barachot. You know, if you accidentally miss one, right, you can go back and fix it, but then you can go back to the, you know, to the point where you were at before, you know, before. So, so you, and, uh-huh. and, and it's not a, and it's not problematic in that sense. So, so in other words, you're, Understanding that in muktam umuuchar batayra, the rule in Taira that sometimes the Taira is not in order, it's not a chronological order. You want to connect that with the Shmona Esrei and say that the Shmona Esrei also maybe. No, well, I'm saying that maybe this is the way Rashi is looking at it. Right, you're, you're, uh, and, and, and he's seeing it similar to the the Chumash being not in chronological order. It's an interesting thought. I never thought about it that way. Um, uh, you know, the, the real truth of the matter is we have to look into the source of the blessings of Shemona Esrei uh, being in order. Because there is a source brought in Shulchan Aruch that, um, that, that, you know, that the brachas need to be in order. And it might be, uh, it might be based on this Gemara. I'm just wondering if there's another Gemara as well about it. But, uh, you know, when it says... Uh, um, um, that 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 uh, where do you go back to? I wonder if this would be the source. Could take a look. Uh, I could. I'll take a one fast look, but I don't want to spend too much time. In case we don't find it here.
<laughs> okay. Um, So this law is in chapter 119. It says, if a person made a mistake or skipped one of the middle brachas, he doesn't have to go back to the beginning, only to the beginning of the bracha that he made a mistake or skipped and continue from there in the order. So it, it, it sounds pretty clearly that he's, that the uh, Shulchan Aruch is following Teisvis's view um, and the Mishabura says, if you were to go back and only do the one you missed, you end up um, messing up the order of the brachas and you don't fulfill your obligation of Shemona Esra. Because the order of the brachas is from the Anshei Knesset HaGdoyla, and they relied the order on Sukkim. So I don't know if it says that clearly in the, I must say it somewhere clearly in the Shulchan Aruch, but uh, I don't have it in front of me exactly where it says that rule, that the order of the brachas, it sounds like it's, a, it's another law here. That the order is, I, I, I believe I've seen it, or, you know, that, that there is an order to the brachas and, and you can't. And, that, and the question is, how does Rashi learn? So in other words, you know, what, what is the source of that? And I, I guess it's the Gemara. There is a Gemara, I believe, in Tractate Megillah that, that does tell us the order of the brachas, why each bracha comes after the one comes. There's a certain order. And maybe based, maybe it's in that Gemara. I'd have to look it up. Uh, that Gemara might be the source and that we would have to compare with Rashi, figure out how Rashi is learning. So in any event, uh, what comes out from this is that the uh, the order of the brachas is important. And of course, especially the way Teisvis is understanding it. And you need to, uh, even if you skip, you go back to the one you messed up and you go on from there. Uh, Susan had a question. Susan, do you remember your question? Yes, I do. Uh, the question is, you're talking about the the davening the in the, with the minion the the, the with those services. You're not talking about Friday night where everybody is in because when when it sounds to me like you're if if the husband makes a mistake, forgets a bracha and says, "Oh, I made a mistake," he's breaking the kavana of the whole temple. Well, well, this is the thing. Keep in mind that we're talking about in the olden days when people would pray by heart. And nowadays, it's, it's, it's much less common that someone makes a mistake and misses the okay. misses a, misses right. a paragraph. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, ben. Make some mistakes. I wanted to say, wanted to say that I side with, with Tosfos and... <laughs> Uh, because the reason we're going back is because we missed something. But when when you when you do the correction and then you skip two more, you are really messing up the whole thing. So you do the what you miss, and from there on stay in order. Don't make oh, another, don't make mess up the order again. Okay. So I think Tosfos is right. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Moshe. What about the Berachot in the beginning, you know, before we, uh, we enter the Beit Knesset? Is that also the, uh, does that also have to be set in order, you know? Oh, that's a good question. 
Very good question. I, I'd have to look it up. It's a whole different uh, category than these brachas. But we'd have you to would look think up if it applies book. to one set of rules, it would apply to the... Uh... Not necessarily, but it could be that one bracha or two brachas might be might 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 have to be said in order. I have to look up which ones uh, specifically. There might be like you know, once you say a later bracha, it sort of includes the other, the earlier. Uh, I have to just make sure and, and see if it's if, if it says that. Um, okay, so we have a few minutes left. So let's try to let's uh, let's uh, read the next little piece of Gemara. Amar uh, Yehuda. The oilam al yishal adam tzracha. A person should not ask for their needs. Lai b'shalish rishaynais, not in the first three brachas, but lai b'shalish achraynais, not in the last three brachas. Ella be'em tzoyos, only in the middle brach. So in the middle brachas is where a person should ask for their needs, not in the first three, and not in the last three. The Amar Reb Chanina. Because Rabbi Hanina says, we shine this shavach with Nerab. The first brachas are similar to a slave, a servant that uh, prepares his praise before his master. In Tsoyais, the middle ones, Doimala Ebed is similar to a servant, Shemavakesh Pras Nerab, that requests a payment or a reward from his master. Achrainais. The last ones, Daimela Eved, similar to a servant, Shekibel Pras Me Rabboi, that received a reward from his master, Viniftar Vahilachur. And he uh, is dismissed and he goes. So, Viniftar, or he takes, Rashi says it means he takes permission. He takes permission. And then he goes. So what comes out from this statement of Rabbi Hanina is that when you say the first three blessings, you're praising Hashem, of course. The middle ones, you're asking Hashem for your needs. And the last ones, you're supposed to feel that you got the reward. And now you're asking for permission to leave. Now, what does that mean? Did you really get your reward already? You just asked. So there is a famous uh, commentary on this Gemara that tells, that says, the Mabit has a, a beautiful insight here. He says that praying, when you daven, you're connecting to Hashem. You're getting closeness to Hashem. And so when you asked, you received your reward. By the end of the Shemana Esrei, you've received your reward because you've connected, you've, you've, uh, you've, you've connected to Hashem already. And um, uh, this is the greatest reward that you can imagine by davening, you've connected to Hashem, and now, it, now you're able to leave. So the reward that we're talking about here is the connection that you have with Hashem. On, a, on, on another note, you could say another another alternative option of explaining this Gemara is right when you add, does say that terem yikra vani en, before you call out, Hashem answers us. So really Hashem gives us whatever we ask for before we even are asking. It's just that it's in a heavenly realm that has to be developed. So we ask Hashem for parnasa, for sustenance, let's say, so it could be that the check didn't arrive yet, but it's already in its making. It's already on its way, so to speak. It's already there in the heavens that it's meant that we're supposed to get a certain uh, uh, substantial uh, amount of money. And it's, it, it just hasn't materialized in this physical world. But spiritually, Hashem has already answered us. So that would be another way of understanding it. So when we're leaving, we already know Hashem answered our prayers. We just, maybe it, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, come, it hasn't expressed itself. We don't see the actual check yet, but we're in the middle of Shemana Esrei. We're finishing the Shemana Esrei. Hashem has already answered our prayers. Okay, we're going to conclude here, and uh, I'll see you later, Mitzvah Hashem.